Hello and welcome. The 30 poor Indian farmers became the first and the youngest girl to climb Mount Everest uh, recently. The reason we are talking about this is the organization which in some ways was responsible for creating uh, uh, this, uh, this feat uh, and powering this feat is the Andhra Pradesh Social Welfare Residential Educational Institutions, a government body which works with poor and disadvantaged uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe and other backward uh, class students and prepares them uh, for the world ahead. We are now joined and uh, happy to be joined by R.S. Praveen, an IPS officer who runs uh, the APSWRIES out of uh, Hyderabad. And uh, we are going to ask him uh, uh, what it takes to uh, succeed in a, at a time like this and really do disadvantages matter. I am joined uh, as always by Ayaz Beman at Cricketwala. Ayaz, so what's the kind of question do you think we should be posing today? There are two things which strike me about this. One is obviously the hmm. the the handicaps that uh, 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 you know somebody like this girl has to overcome, and the fact that she's a girl hmm. and climbing the Everest. These both seem so anachronistic in the Indian scenario. Yeah. Uh, that a girl is getting this kind of encouragement, and she's showing the ability, the capabilities, and of course the fact that a state uh, you know state-run enterprise like this is delivering the goods. We are we are so cynical or skeptical yeah. about anything which is state-run that this is a welcome change. Right, thanks. Uh, uh, Praveen, uh, let's begin, uh, you know, uh, I know that you were in the police force earlier and you joined uh, the, uh, uh, the APSWREI. Uh, what made you do that? And, you know, before, before we come to what you're doing today and, uh, uh, you know, the conditions which led to, let's say, this young uh, girl achieving this feat. Well, uh, you know, I was uh, still, uh, a student of uh, the same institutions. Uh, uh, 25 to 30 years ago, so uh, this is uh, one of the payback uh, you know, movements for me. So uh, I did, um, you know, I, I did do uh, a very hardcore policing for about 18 years. So I thought for a while, like, why not take sabbatical and then uh, uh, contribute to the society, which is responsible for my own growth. So I, uh, after I finished my uh, master's degree in the Harvard University, I came back and then I requested my chief minister to. The then Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh State, undivided. So I requested him to give me an opportunity to pay back to the you know uh, society, society I mean organization uh, which is responsible for whatever I am today. So I also wanted to you know uh, you know uh, go to each and every school and then tell my story all the to all the children so that they select a right road model and then they. Uh, uh, they should not have that hopelessness uh, in them that look, uh, uh, we are so poor and then we are so marginalized and nobody is taking care of them. So I wanted to instill a kind of hope and inspiration, inspire these people. Tell us about, uh, uh, the, you know, you have over 290 schools as I understand now under, uh, under this uh, body. How, how do you administratively function and how do you differentiate yourself from other schools? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, uh, we have about uh, 290 schools, as you have rightly said. Uh, we give uh, education to 1,70,000 poorest of the poor children, and then 110,000 of them are girls, especially. Then uh, we take the children uh, from the most marginalized communities, especially from rural areas. And then our admissions, uh, we uh, you know we conduct an entrance examination until recently, we were just selecting the children on lottery system, on a lottery basis, that is randomization procedure. Now uh, we started conducting an entrance examination and then we take about 25,000 children per annum. And uh, our classes started fifth grade and then ours is a 100% a grantee organization of Andhra Pradesh government. Now uh, we follow a plate to slate approach like uh, children come empty handed and then they go with a lot of knowledge from our society and then we provide them everything. They don't have to pay anything from their pockets and uh, we take care of their uniform, the plates and the textbooks, notebooks. Healthcare, uh, dormitory, everything, everything is uh, provided for uh, you know by the state. So, and the second most important uh, feature in this uh, system, which is uh, uh, very different from the public schools or day schools, is our teachers stay at the places of their posting. So, teachers play the role of parents. So, the students they grow in a different ecosystem, and then they attain the personalities of the teachers who teach them every day. So, from nine to five p.m., uh, teachers play the role of a teacher. And then from 6 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 and then morning again 5 to 9 p.m., 9 a.m., the teachers play the role of parents. So it's a very uh, unique system uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it has been a, a successful experiment uh, for the last 30 years. Yeah. Just, just to come back to this 13-year-old girl, so 
uh, what did you spot enough latent talent in her w was there a resistance from people around her that she's getting into something like this an expedition of climbing the everest is you know the, the idea itself is so daunting and for a young girl like that to go ahead and do it so what did it take were there hardships to overcome uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, the, the question uh, you are asking is that how did I find that talent? How did I spot the talent among people? So this is uh, uh, you know, charge as the secretary or head of these institutions. So uh, instead of staying in the office in this uh, cozy and then uh, you know uh, comfortable uh, office rooms uh, which are really air conditioned, so I I didn't I didn't want to do that obviously. So I shifted my office to in the schools. Like uh, every week, I used to visit about three to four schools. In the last uh, two years, I have visited about uh, 200 uh, social welfare residential schools, and then I have personally spoken to about 70 to 80,000 children. So the most important thing that I have observed, I've been observing, is uh, these children have exceptional talents, and uh, they have a lot of recognition. And they come from a very you know challenging environment. And then their survival skills are unparalleled and amazing. So, uh, uh, until recently, we didn't have uh, the games and sports for the children. And then, all through, we were only chasing the percentages, pass percentages, and then good, uh, you know, marks in the classrooms. And then, children also, you know, once you force them to, um, you know, cram something, and then they cram, and then they reproduce the answer scripts. And then, all the teachers are happy, and the students are also happy because everybody is getting uh, 90 percent or 95 percent of the marks. So. Uh, that was a kind of orientation which all our institutions had. But now, after I took over, what I did was like that is only one part of the entire uh, academics. The other part of the academics is uh, extracurricular activities which contribute to the all round development of the child. So, we try to address to the other emotional and then other uh, intellectual and psychological needs of the children by providing these, uh, these opportunities. So, when I started meeting these people, I found a lot of talent and then innate energy in them. That's how I spotted Puna, that's how I spotted Anand Kumar, that's how I spotted a lot of uh, you know people who are doing extremely well in extracurricular activities as well. Yeah. So, you know, this, uh, uh, I, I'm just looking at it uh, sequentially or chronologically. You know, it's a 13 year old girl. Uh, someone for I mean one is to spot her and then give her the uh, the backing and the support to do something like climb a mountain and obviously the highest mountain in the world now you don't have any mountains where you are or at least of this size and uh, stature uh, so how did that all happen how did it come together look uh, uh, I, I had a, I had a, uh, my uh, I had a uh, principal secretary by name Raymond Peter so he knew uh, a guy uh, from South India who scaled Mount Everest his name is Shekhar Babu so he scaled Mount Everest in year 2007 and then he's the winner of uh, Tenjing Nage Awadi that, that is uh, given to a, a mountaineer by President of India. So this Shekhar Babu is also from public school system and he's from a lower middle class family. His father working as a just conductor in uh, road transport corporation. So this Shekhar Babu is very active. And uh, I spoke to the Shekhar Baba and then I just, uh, you know, uh, dropped the idea of like, uh, what about, uh, you know, having an adventure sport in our uh, schools. The most important uh, uh, roadblock we faced was the parents. You know, most of the parents, because adventure sports per se, they are very dangerous. You know, you can lose life or you can get maimed, for, you, can, you can lose your limbs or you can be, you know, permanently, uh, you know, uh, disabled uh, 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 because of the very nature of the sport. So uh, Shekhar Babu, uh, you know, he helped us to uh, understand the entire uh, rock climbing and then initially we didn't have Everest in our mind, to, I'm being very honest with you. So we had only rock climbing uh, as uh, adventure sport in our mind and then we started with rock climbing. But once we started, like we have a formidable, uh, you know, uh, hills in our uh, region, not so as high as uh, the Himalayas, but definitely we have formidable uh, rock formations in our Andhra Pradesh as well. So we started the rock climbing exercise and then we got about 110 people with great difficulty we have to convince parents and then we took indemnity bonds and uh, we assured them that nothing is going to happen and then if something goes wrong we are definitely going to take care of uh, these people. So but once we started this rock climbing course then to our shock and dismay almost 20 to 25 people scored A grade. So once we saw the potential of these children, then immediately I spoke to Himalayan Mountaineering Institute in the Darjeeling and then I requested them whether it is possible to train the children of this age in uh, high, you know, uh, uh, basic and advanced mountaineering, mountaineering exercises. So they said yes. Uh, what, is the, what was the age band? Sorry. Uh, 
uh, age, uh, age uh, uh, you, you, are you asking about age? When the, all these 25 students who scored A grade, what age age group were they in, broadly, yeah. roughly? That's, that's a good question. So the youngest was about uh, youngest was uh, Purna herself, and then another boy was also 13 years old. He, both are ninth graders, and then the eldest one was about uh, um, uh, 17 years, 17 years or so. So the average age was uh, uh, 15 years, something like that. So when we requested the Himalayan Monitoring Institute, they said yes, they can do. But uh, it can work. It can only be introductory um, um, mountaineering, but they cannot be taken for uh, you know a, a basic mountaineering into you know Kanchenjunga mountain range of Himalayas. But uh, after our children arrived, this batch of 20 people, the people who could not see district headquarter in their lives, people who could not afford to have a pair of chappal in their lives, the parents, and then people who could not board a train in their lives. So we made them to sit in those trains and we gave them all facilities and then have sent them to Himalayan Mountaining Institute. There, the most pleasantly surprising thing is that there when these people, there, when Himalayan Mountaining Institute people saw our children going there for a basic mountaining course, they said it's not possible. These are very, very young children. So I requested them to look, up. they might look young, but they have tremendous potential. We have seen their potential. So why don't you conduct a preliminary test, a screening test for them, and then if they are okay with that, and then if they qualify, then, then you can go for a basic mountaineering course. So once they conducted a screening test, a very tough screening test though, so these children, almost all of them got qualified. Then after that, uh, they introduced a special mountaineering course for these children and then lo and behold, these children could, uh, 14 of them could scale up to 17,000 feet and then they conquered a peak called Rinokin Mountain, uh, you know, uh, Kanchenjunga Mountaineering Range. They survived about minus 20 degrees or minus 30 degrees centigrade uh, in uh, Kanchenjunga Mountain Range at the altitude of, uh, you know, 16 to 17,000 feet. So that's where we got the idea, look, when these children could get uh, to that level and then survive at that temperatures, I think, Definitely, they can go a little higher. So, we, I personally flew to Darjeeling. I spoke to all the trainers. Then we took the help of Indian Mountaineering Federation, and then we took them to, uh, you know, much uh, extreme and difficult conditions in the Ladakh region with the help of Indian Mountaineering Federation. And then there also four children, including this girl Puna, they uh, survived minus 35 degrees temperature and then, uh, you know, uh, 20,000 uh, uh, feet. So, right from beginning, I was very particular that uh, one of the mountaineers must be a girl. So it is very important that the girls uh, should scale such uh, higher peaks and then because we have a very strict code of conduct in our institutions and then there are 10 commandments in our institutions where all our 1.7 lakh children recite every day and night. Then the first commandment is I am not inferior to anyone. So this is the commandment with which we start our day, all our children. So uh, Purna and all of us, the, the girl who had scaled Mount Everest, so all of us, we believe, and then that's why I was very, very particular that uh, one of the mountaineers must be a girl. So uh, that's how uh, the idea of uh, sending a girl to Mount Everest started. Praveen, yeah. what are the range of activities do you have? I mean, you know, this, this girl has been a stellar performer, you know, for a 13 year old, to, year old to be on top of the Everest uh, is a spectacular achievement. But not everybody can get there. What are the other things? Are there any targets? Are there any benchmarks that you're setting for the kids? Uh, not everyone uh, can scale Mount Everest. I do agree because it is uh, one of the dangerous, uh, you know, uh, uh, exercises uh, in a uh, high altitude mountaineering. And then you can, you can, uh, it is hard. It's a lot of dangers, including death. And then even this year itself, uh, we had uh, 18, uh, you know, 18 to 19 deaths. So that apart, uh, the uh, we want all the girls, uh, especially the poorest of the poor, to believe that uh, they have tremendous potential in them and. Uh, one need uh, everyone need not be a mountaineer like Pune, but uh, they can be. Uh, they, they can they can do very well in academics. They can do. Uh, they can be a very good singers. Like I have seen with my own eyes. I I found some of the outstanding uh, singers and musicians in these uh, children and the very good painters. And then some of them are very good sportsmen. And then uh, uh, some of them are very good actors. Like for example, in our society, we are giving them an exclusive capsule on film making. And then most of the children, the, at least some of the children, they may not be very good at academics, but they are very good at other uh, types of arts. So the benchmark is like the sky is the limit for uh, everyone, provided the opportunity is given. So we wanted to prove to the world that the gap between the poorest and the richest is opportunity. If opportunity is given, poorest 
the, the uh, poorest and the weakest in this world can go to the highest point in this world. So that, that opportunity is the most critical thing. That's what we have done as an organization, as a government. Uh, Praveen, as we were talking, we are also showing pictures of uh, Pune climbing uh, the Everest and uh, they are obviously very, very uh, impressive pictures. Uh, you know, I had two questions. So one is you said that you do have an entrance exam and, you know, and, and obviously there is a level of filtration there. So while the entrance exam helps you get the best, uh, is it, uh, would it also be fair to say that the best would have done well anywhere under any conditions uh, given the kind of uh, uh, excellence and the, the environment of excellence that you are creating? Um, not really. See, this sentence examination is only to, like, we are not here to really, uh, you know, screen uh, and uh, select the best people uh, uh, in our society. But the, the very purpose of conducting entrance examination in our society is to see that the people who enter into our institutions know basics of, uh, you know, uh, English and uh, mathematics. Because all our schools, all 290 schools of our uh, society are English medium schools. So when we select the children from uh, rural and uh, you know uh, uh, areas, rural areas, so we want them to know a little bit of uh, English. Otherwise, uh, it will be very traumatic for them. So otherwise, we are not uh, we 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 not believe in you know uh, excluding children just because uh, they are being in particular this thing. But the the only endeavor is like the people who are very serious in academics, the people who are uh, very good. They should not be you know excluded in randomization procedure. So that, that that's the intention. Otherwise, you know, very, we are not very serious about people on that so entrance examination is just to see whether the children are able to read and uh, uh, write that's all I, mean, uh, I was also seeing that uh, uh, you've said that you know uh, you sent almost 60 students to various iits uh, nits or the former recs uh, and other uh, engineering and medical college so tell us about that i mean how you seem to be obviously achieving a pretty high hit rate when it comes to traditional studies as well i mean apart from the 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 vocational pursuits uh, how are you doing this uh, uh, earlier, uh, we didn't have this scheme at all in our mind. So, but uh, we thought uh, uh, there are so many brilliant children who are, whose uh, careers are going waste. Uh, you know, like once uh, we give education only up to 12th grade, then after 12th grade, uh, they go out of our society and then they join different degree colleges. Although they have tremendous capacities to, you know, uh, do well in their uh, uh, further careers. So, in 2001, we started the uh, IIT Coaching Academy and then. Uh, uh, we started the, taking the best of the children on based on the on the basis of uh, 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 entrance examination within our organization. So uh, the best children would uh, the best and most gifted children they came to uh, uh, our IIT academy in our own society, and then we took the best of our government school teachers, and then we uh, brought them to one place, and they started giving uh, coaching for about uh, one and a half to two years. And uh, initially we had only 10 to 15 people qualifying for IITs and IITs, but uh, for the last five years, at least uh, 70 to 80 people were getting qualified for uh, you know IITs and uh, NITs. For example, this year, uh, 79 people got qualified for uh, you know IIT advanced uh, examination this year, and then uh, uh, the results of advanced examination were to be uh, announced. So, for the last uh, 10 years, uh, we have had sent about 250 children to both uh, uh, IITs and NITs. So this is this is a very good uh, you know strike because we take only uh, 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 80 children uh, per batch, and this right. year we have uh, medicine, so long term uh, medicine courses, and then we are hoping that uh, we'll go, we'll get good results, and then uh, this year we also started uh, 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 CACPT, that is uh, Chartered Accountancy, and then uh, Common Law Admission Test as well. So we are just making forays into different other sectors. Uh, yeah. So that's that's fantastic. But now, what is there a skew between boys and girls? Is there is there a, a kind of a huge this huge gap between the number of boys that you've got and the girls for socio cultural reasons that the girls are not being allowed to join or can't be can't be joining in? Uh, it's a it's a really fantastic question. I really like your question. See, uh, our uh, fortunately our thrust right from the beginning has been on girls. For every uh, uh, one boy school in our society, there are two girls schools. In other words, uh, for uh, we have about uh, 120,000 children, that is 1,20,000 girl children and the rest of them are boys. So, and uh, whatever new schools we are trying to build, and we are uh, basically concentrating on girls because, you know, in our society, girls are uh, basically, you know, unfortunately, 
are uh, seen as liability more so in rural areas. Urban areas, the things are changing faster, but in rural areas, uh, still uh, uh, people consider them as a liability. So we, are, at least as a state, uh, we have taken the responsibility of uh, assuring the parents, look, you may be very poor, but it is the state's responsibility to educate your child. So that's why we have created as many institutions as possible to give a quality education to these girls at state's cost. Parents do not have to uh, pay even a single penny from their pockets to educate these girls. That's how uh, we have been concentrating and then bring you know, gender uh, equality in the entire education system. So, Praveen, uh, as we look ahead, uh, I think we have two questions. I mean, one is, uh, you know, what are your own uh, challenges and tasks in terms of where you want to take this uh, institution to or this uh, uh, conglomerate of institutions? The second is, if this model has to be replicated <laughs> across the country in some way, how could we do it? Question again. See, the first challenge we have is uh, teachers. Unfortunately, you know, one is uh, uh, the number of teachers uh, is really insufficient. Uh, we are, we still need to work on that aspect. Then, second is although we have teachers, we need uh, quality teachers. The dynamics in the classroom are still a uh, monologue. We need to make the entire classroom dynamics as a dialogue. So that that is the greatest challenge we have, and then we have made a very good beginning on that aspect. Third is uh, empowering the children. So unfortunately, children here are not treated as the major stakeholders. The entire teaching is not uh, child-centric teaching. It is uh, basically teacher had to dump some knowledge on the blackboard, and then uh, that knowledge is transferred into a textbook in the classroom. And then finally, the same knowledge is transferred to answer script, and then that's how you get the ranks and the good grades. But that is not what education is all about. That is not what I personally feel India uh, you know, should have. So India should have a very creative uh, students and then India should have very committed teachers and then India should have a very qualitative and uh, dialogue, uh, qualitative dialogue in the classrooms every day. It should be happening, it should be, it should be a project based uh, you know, learning. Fortunately, we have a continuous comprehensive evaluation and then most of the national quality framework, so national curriculum framework has come up with a very radical uh, thing and now it is for the you know, states to you know, uh, uh, do this kind of uh, quality revolution. So I would say if you give me a billion uh, rupees or billion dollars, so if you ask me to invest uh, in such area, so I would definitely invest in teacher training. Teacher training is the most important thing uh, that has to happen in our country and then uh, we are, uh, that is the major challenge we have. So with regards to your second question, whether this model is scalable or not, absolutely it is scalable, it can be replicated in every state and then it doesn't call for too many resources and then all it needs is a dorm and a school building and a dining hall. So we have 100 schools where classrooms are using as dorms and anyway now we are expanding and we are creating separate dorms. Anyway we are building a school, uh, a separate academic block in all the schools, in those day schools. All you need to do is uh, per constituency, be it assembly constituency or a group of blocks, per constituency you create an institution, you create an academic block and a dormitory, add a dormitory and uh, take uh, 500 to 600 children and then spend 30,000 rupees per child per year minus salaries that is what it needs so for example uh, all put together we are spending about 35,000 rupees per uh, child per year but the results are amazing, about amazing. 945 crores uh, per year is, is what I noticed yeah. 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 I have just included the salaries but I, if you include salaries then the cost per child becomes uh, 60,000 rupees per uh, child but otherwise, uh, it is very much sustainable. The, the current spending of uh, any government on uh, education is just 2.5 uh, to 3 percent. But then you just need to add one more, uh, uh, one uh, another person, like say, take it to 3.5 to 4 percent, and then definitely there will be a, a lot of uh, you know advent, a lot of uh, you know uh, outcome, a very good outcome in this regard. The greatest advantage, what I found in my, in, according to my experience in residential schools, is. The children who come out from residential schools, especially from the marginalized sections, they attain the value systems of the teachers. And then the teach, they attain the personalities of the teachers and then they are really more confident than the children who go to day schools and then nights again they go back to the same subhuman environment where their parents are living. And many places all these parents are masdurs, you know, they, they go out for uh, coolie and then they come back late in the evening and then during that 12 hours interregnum, nobody is there to look after the children. So they stay, they spend only 6 to 7 hours in the school. After that what happens? So residential school is one of the most important interventions a state can afford to make 
to bring change in the lives of uh, marginalized in this country. That's what I strongly believe. And then it is definitely replicable and it is doable and it is scalable. Absolutely, there is no problem. Uh, Praveen, we are running out of time. Uh, one quick last question if I can throw in. So, is, is, is some of these things that you talked about in, in the manner you have scaled up, so is this something they taught you at Harvard or is this something that they did not teach you at Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good question, well, you know, I, 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 I attribute this to, uh, partially to my Harvard stint as well, because uh, I met uh, great people in Harvard and then I met a lot of global leaders who brought tremendous transformation in the lives of their nations, their communities, and in their own neighborhoods. And uh, it, you know, the stint in Harvard always makes you bolder and then makes you think uh, big and aim high. So that's what uh, Harvard had done to me, and then the ecosystem in which. Yes, yes. Praveen, is there anybody else who's in the footsteps of this young 13-year-old girl and wanting to climb the Everest? Is there anybody in your group or some other, some other? And marks that yeah, you to achieve. When I go to my schools, I, if I understand, if I understand your question rightly, so if I go to our schools now, I if I ask all the children like uh, who wants to go to Himalayas so now earlier nobody used to raise their hands. Now everybody is raising his or her hands. So <laughs> right, Praveen. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best in your uh, endeavors to bridge this very critical gap and not just that but also take these young children to great heights uh, uh, not just for your state but also for the country. Thank you so much once again for joining us.